Hello and welcome back to Global Value. Today we're performing a fundamental stock analysis of Kellogg Company, ticker symbol K. So we're looking at the business today as a subscriber request. Currently, Kellogg is trading for $67.68 per share. Over the past year, their stock price is up 2%. So even though this isn't a lot, this is actually outperforming the S&P 500 index over this time frame. Over the last five years, Kellogg's stock price is almost exactly flat. Over the last 10 years, their stock price is only up 13% overall, so they're only compounding at a rate of about 1% annually. And going back prior to the global financial crisis, over the last 18 years, Kellogg is only up at a rate of about 2.5% compounded annually in terms of their stock price. Keep in mind that the company does pay out dividends, so their average dividend yield throughout this time frame would be in addition to this compounded annual return. And currently, Kellogg is paying out a dividend yield of about 3.4%, so that's nearly twice the yield that you'd be receiving from an S&P 500 ETF right now. Kellogg has not had a lot of volatility in their stock price over the past year. Currently, they're trading snugly between their 52-week high and their 52-week low, almost exactly right in the middle. Kellogg does have a little bit of short interest around their business, with about 3.5% of their shares outstanding currently sold short, and they have about a $23 billion market cap. For additional background about the business, founded in 1906, Kellogg is a leading global manufacturer and marketer of cereals, cookies, crackers, and other packaged goods. Its offerings are manufactured in 21 countries and marketed in more than 180 countries. Its product mix includes well-known brands such as Special K, Frosted Flakes, Fruit Loops, Rice Krispies, Pop-Tarts, Ego, Kashi, and Morningstar Farms. The firm added the Pringles brand to its mix in 2012. Sales outside of its home turf account for about 40% of Kellogg's consolidated sales base. The firm intends to split its global snacking arm from its North American cereal and plant-based alternative segments by the end of calendar 2023. Kellogg Company was founded in 1906 and is headquartered in Battle Creek, Michigan. So for our fundamental analysis today, we are performing the Select 6 analysis, taking a checklist style approach of six standard financial metrics to come to a holistic and beginning understanding of Kellogg based off of their business fundamentals. So this analysis is still a work in progress and it's an opportunity to learn in public, so it will continue to improve and get better over time. With that said, let's get right into today's analysis. Starting things off with metric number one, we want their average return on capital over the last five years to be above 14%. And there are two key reasons for this. The first is that over the long run, over the course of decades, a stock is likely to return approximately what its underlying business returns. And these business returns are going to be captured here by return on capital. The second is that the average publicly listed business earns about a 7% return on capital. So by looking for a benchmark of 14% or higher here, we can potentially build in some margin of safety for ourselves based off the overall quality of the business being about twice as good as average. So Kellogg has earned pretty stable and pretty steady returns on capital in the mid-teens over their last five years. There really was not a lot of deviation in their returns on capital over this time frame, and averaged out over these last five years, Kellogg is earning about a 14.5% return on capital, so just coming in slightly above that 14% benchmark we're looking for. So this is going to be a check here on metric number one, as the company's returns on capital are solidly about twice as good as those of a typical business. Next up for metric number two, here we're taking a high level overview of the growth of their business. So we're looking for revenue, net income, and free cash flow growth over the last five years. And this metric is going to be all or nothing in nature. Either all three of these are up for this to be a check, or if even one of these is down, this entire metric will be an X. So over this time frame, Kellogg has moderately grown their revenues by about 13%. So their revenues are up. Their earnings, however, have declined by about a fourth. So their earnings are down by 28%. Looking at their income statement, this came from a couple of different things. So one is that their cost of goods sold increased by quite a bit, lowering their gross margins by about 5% overall. Their operating margins have declined by about 3% over this time frame. Then the company also had other non-operating expenses, as well as they had about a $67 million merger and restructuring charge. So the main thing for their earnings was that increased cost of goods sold, but those others contributed as well to this earnings decline. Looking at their free cash flows, however, Kellogg's free cash flows have increased by about 21% over the last five years. That's especially important because free cash flow is really the lifeblood of any business and a business can use its free cash flows to reinvest back in the company, make acquisitions, buy back shares, pay dividends, or pay down debt. 
and ultimately a business's abilities to produce free cash flows now and until judgment day discounted back by some reasonable interest rate is what that business is going to be worth. So it is nice to see that the business both grew its revenues and their free cash flows. However, because their earnings are down over this time frame, this is going to be an X here on metric number two. Next up for metric number three, here we're taking the perspective of an individual shareholder in the business by looking at Kellogg on a per share basis. So we're looking for earnings per share growth over the last five years. As we just learned in our previous metric, their earnings are down over this time frame. However, we still want to look at what the company has done in terms of their shares outstanding. There's not a lot to say about their shares outstanding as Kellogg has marginally diluted existing shareholders in the business by only about 1% over the last five years. While ideally we would want a company to be keeping their shares outstanding flat or buying back shares, 1% dilution is likely nothing to write home about. And so their earnings per share are going to be down over this time frame because of their, because of their decline in their earnings. So this is an X here on metric number three. As in their most recent fiscal year, Kellogg earned $2.79 per share. Metric number four, we're looking for something very similar, but this is going to be the opposite result. So here we're looking for free cash flow per share growth over the last five years. So because their free cash flows are up, but their shares outstanding are just marginally diluted over this time frame, this is going to be a check here on metric number four for Kellogg. Over their last 12 months, Kellogg has produced $3.40 of free cash flow per share for each share that they've had outstanding. And so through our first four metrics, to recap, we are split evenly two checks and two X's for Kellogg. Next up for metric number five, here we're evaluating how the business is utilizing debt. So we don't want to be investing in overly levered businesses because during economic downturns, it's overly levered businesses that are going to be at the greatest risk of poor outcomes. So we want their net debt, which is their total debt minus their cash and their short-term investments to be below the amount of free cash flow that the business has produced over the last five years. So Kellogg has been reducing their net debt position over this time frame. Currently, the business has about $6.9 billion worth of net debt. However, over the last five years, Years, Kellogg has only produced $5.3 billion worth of free cash flow when we add up all of these years. So relative to the business's ability to produce free cash flows, it does look like Kellogg is employing quite a bit of debt in their business. So this is going to be an X here on metric number five. Even if we were to extrapolate their free cash flows over their most recent fiscal year of $1.16 billion, if Kellogg would earn that same amount over the next five years, they still would not be able to support their current net debt position. So this could be a potential concern here for Kellogg as the company does look like it's using more debt than their free cash flows can support. And so this may be something that you would want to dig into and learn more about. The company will break out their debt profile in more detail in their filings, and you'll be able to understand how this debt is structured, when it matures, what rates it's at, and if it's subject to any particular covenants. Again, though, this is an X on metric number five. And so far through our first five metrics, we have two checks and three Xs for Kellogg. Then our sixth and final metric, the big metric of them all, we want their average free cash flow to their total enterprise value to give us a yield that's above 5%. If this is the case, this may provide us with a reasonable starting point for evaluation of Kellogg and may offer us a potential risk premium to the yield of the 10-year treasury. Kellogg currently has a $30.5 billion total enterprise value, and we're using their total enterprise value because it takes into account both the company's net debt position and their market cap, and it's going to give us a more accurate perspective of the business that's going to be more similar to as if Kellogg were a private company. We also learned in our previous metric that Kellogg has produced $5.3 billion worth of free cash flow over the last five years, meaning that in an average year, they're producing just slightly above $1 billion worth of free cash flow. So when we divide their $1 billion of their average free cash flow by their $30.5 billion total enterprise value, that's only going to give us about a 3.2% average free cash flow to enterprise value yield for Kellogg. So that's coming in slightly below the yield of the 10-year treasury. And that's also a couple of percentage points below that 5% risk premium we're looking for. And so on an average basis of their free cash flows here, this is going to be an X on metric number six, as it doesn't look like the business is offering that risk premium relative to the yield of the 10-year treasury to get a current free cash flow to enterprise value yield for Kellogg when we divide their $1,160,000,000 worth of their last 12 months of free cash flow by their $30.5 billion total enterprise value. That only gives us about a 3.8% current free cash flow to enterprise value yield for Kellogg. So while that is slightly above the yield of the 10-year treasury, that's still below that 5% risk premium as well. So it doesn't look like Kellogg would be offering that risk premium on either a current or an average basis of their free cash flows. So please keep in mind that just because this is an X here on metric number six, 
metrics doesn't mean that you're going to throw out Kellogg in its entirety. This is just one of our six metrics. And while these metrics are simple, they're meant to be taken in holistically. And when they're combined together, they can be very powerful. Plus, there are still some things about Kellogg that you may find interesting. So then as a bonus here, we're taking a look at Kellogg's dividend profile. So again, currently Kellogg pays out a 3.4% dividend yield, which is about double that of the yield that you'd be receiving from an S&P 500 ETF currently. However, people make mistakes by blindly chasing dividends. So it's important to stop and look at the underlying fundamentals of a business to determine whether or not that company's dividends are healthy and well supported by their ability to produce free cash flows or earnings depending on the type of business. We want their dividends to be well supported by their free cash flows, and that's been the case in four of their last five fiscal years. Kellogg was able to support their dividend payouts with their free cash flows in all of these years besides fiscal 2019. And although the company is paying out a relatively high percentage of their free cash flows as dividends, it does look like the company is maintaining a reasonable dividend payout ratio. Kellogg has grown their dividends in all five of these years. However, keep in mind that the company does look like it's utilizing quite a bit of debt relative to the free cash flows that the business is producing. So even though their dividend has been growing throughout this time frame and Kellogg has grown their free cash flows overall, there may be competing uses of their free cash flows for the business. So if you're interested in Kellogg in part for its abilities to return cash to shareholders through their dividends, you'd likely want to dig in and learn more about management's approach to capital allocation going forward and really understand how they're going to prioritize where they're allocating their free cash flows. Please keep in mind that past performance is no guarantee for the future, but it does look like Kellogg's dividend profile has been in okay shape throughout this last five years. Everything we've discussed so far is important, but there's something missing that in my opinion is the main reason to analyze Kellogg, which takes us on to using a discounted cash flow model to come to a potential fair intrinsic value for Kellogg. A discounted cash flow model is just like any other model in any other discipline. Its outputs are going to be sensitive to its inputs. So here we're starting with Kellogg's average free cash flows over their last three years, and we're using historical growth assumptions for how the business has grown dating back all the way till 1990 in order to give us a baseline projected estimate for Kellogg out into the future. So it's up to you to do your own homework here to determine whether or not these historical growth assumptions are going to be accurate and applicable going forward for Kellogg. So if we assume that Kellogg grows their average free cash flows at a rate of about 5% annually over the next 10 years, and then during the 10 years out after that, so projecting 20 years out into the future in total, these future free cash flows would grow at a rate of 4% annually. We're not going to be adding in the company's tangible book value because that's going to be skewed based off of the share buybacks that Kellogg has done over the past nearly 30 years. Kellogg has pretty steadily reduced their share count over the last couple of decades, so the accounting is not going to be completely reflective of economic reality for the business. Then if we were seeking a 15% rate of return from Kellogg, which is the rate of return that Warren Buffett is ideally looking for from his investments, in addition to his margin of safety requirements, it looks like from today's valuations of Kellogg that a fair value for their business would only be about $32 per share. So that's less than half of the business's current stock price. Keep in mind that this 15% rate of return would also be including their dividend yields, so we would not be doubly counting their dividends, and so their stock price would really only be compounding at a rate of about 12% annually. Also, a 15% rate of return would be dramatically outperforming Kellogg's overall returns to shareholders throughout the past couple of decades. And please keep in mind that a discounted cash flow model is based off the overall predictability of a business's future free cash flows. Kellogg has had some stability and predictability in their business business over the past several decades. Even so, it seems to be the case that much of this predictability has been priced into the businesses. Please be mindful of the fact that this type of analysis is not financial advice. It's not a buy or sell recommendation of any security. And before considering any potential investment decision, please consult with the properly licensed and registered legal and financial professionals. So in just a minute, we'll talk about our summary for Kellogg, but we have to address something first. What are some of the qualitative aspects of this business, especially those that support the key points for either a potential long or a potential short thesis for Kellogg. Starting with some of the key points around a potential long thesis for Kellogg, number one, the firm has built an industry-leading presence in faster-growing emerging markets, which account for about one-fourth of its total sales base, which should bolster its top-line prospects. Number two, it's thought that Pringles should aid Kellogg's pursuit to build out its global distribution, as snacks have broader appeal with consumers around the world than cold cereal. And number three, Kellogg has shown it can win even in an intensely competitive landscape, 
The company has 19 consecutive quarters of organic sales growth in Europe, a mature market where private label has pronounced share and retail consolidation has run rampant. Then for some of the key points around a potential short thesis for Kellogg, number one, a cohort of Kellogg's domestic unionized employees were on strike for 12 weeks in late 2021, which impeded Kellogg's abilities to meet demand and drive sales. A tight labor market could prompt further dislocation at times. Number two, cost reduction efforts may not always prove beneficial. Kellogg sought to remove costs about a decade ago, but failed to concurrently invest in manufacturing and distribution to support growth, resulting in recalls as quality control languished. And number three, similar to peers, Kellogg has strained to keep up with the rapid evolution of consumer trends, weighing on volume growth. So hopefully that offers a potentially balanced perspective around some of the key qualitative aspects of the business. Now it's time for our wrap up. So in summary, Kellogg checks the box on two out of six metrics today, so it looks like the company is weakly attractive for further research into the business. Kellogg earns average returns on capital that are in the mid-teens, slightly above that 14% benchmark we're looking for. While their revenues and their free cash flows have grown modestly over the past five years, their earnings are down and they've just marginally diluted shareholders. Even with their free cash flow growth, it looks like the business is employing more debt than what their free cash flows would reasonably be able to support on both a current and an average basis. Then it looks like Kellogg's current and average free cash flow to enterprise value yields would not be offering that potentially attractive risk premium in comparison to the yield of the 10-year treasury. Kellogg did look like it was able to support their dividends in four of the past five years. However, with higher debt loads on the business than what it looks like their free cash flows can reasonably and healthily support, there may be more of a focus on management's competing uses for their free cash flows in the future. So if you're interested in the business, it's likely worth your time to dig in and understand their approach to capital allocation going forward. Finally, performing a discounted cash flow analysis of Kellogg. If you've done the work and you believe that those historical growth assumptions are going to be accurate and applicable going forward for the business, based off today's valuations of the company, if you were seeking a 15% rate of return from Kellogg, then it looks like a potential fair intrinsic value for their business is only around $32 per share. So that's less than half of their current stock price. That's down significantly from anywhere close to what the business has traded at in their most recent several years. However, that rate of return would be significantly outperforming how Kellogg has performed in the public markets over the past couple decades. It is worth reiterating that this type of analysis is not financial advice, it's not a buy or sell recommendation of any security, and before considering any potential investment decision, please consult with your financial advisor. This analysis instead serves as a beginning and holistic understanding to help you determine whether it's worth your time and energy to dig in and learn more about Kellogg. One resource that will definitely help you stay up to speed with what's going on in the market and help you learn more about the business is Seeking Alpha. Checking out Seeking Alpha directly supports the channel as I'm part of their affiliate program. So most of you probably know Seeking Alpha as a source of community written articles on different stocks. But over the past little while, they've actually become a lot more than that with their new offering, which is Seeking Alpha Premium. Premium has a number of different features where you can track buy, hold, and sell ratings on your favorite stocks. These ratings are from the Seeking Alpha community, Wall Street analysts, and Seeking Alpha's algorithm. You can see earnings call transcripts, investor presentations, SEC filings, and press releases all in one place. You can add your own margin of safety targets and get alerts for when your favorite stocks hit that level. You can get unlimited access to Seeking Alpha articles, and you can tailor your reading experience based on the type of investor you are. You can get 10 years of financial data on any stock to help you with your analysis. You can also import your portfolio into your Seeking Alpha dashboard to make researching easier. And if that didn't convince you, the best thing is that an annual plan is only 119 bucks. That's just 33 cents per day through my referral link down in the description below. Normally premium is $239, but if you use my link, it's 50% off. So check it out if you're interested. So as a value investor, you're ultimately trying to conduct this research as if you're going to own 100% of a business, and you can truly understand the ins and outs of that company, learning about the business accurately, completely, and then going back and asking yourself, what did you miss, in order to come to an understanding of the essence of the underlying business. So through this deeper research, you'll learn more about the qualitative and the quantitative aspects of Kellogg, and you'll likely be able to determine for yourself what a reasonably appropriate intrinsic value for the company will be. 
So with that said, that's it for today's fundamental stock analysis of Kellogg Company, ticker symbol K. We looked at the business today as a subscriber request, and with Kellogg checking the box on two out of our six metrics, it looks like the company is a weak candidate in terms of its attractiveness for further research into the business. Again, that's not meant as an end-all be-all, and it's likely worth your time and effort performing any sort of deep dive into a business. So if you enjoyed today's video, please be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel for more stock analysis videos, and comment down below what business you want me to take a look at next time. Thanks for learning about Kellogg with me and have a great day.